um, where did I start in property? Well, I'm a property investor as well. I'm not just a, an accountant or tax specialist. I am a, an investor down at heart. Um, and I started with single let properties, which generated a whopping 6 or 8% return investment, um, well, between those two ratios anyway. And um, I thought I was doing really well and uh, buying single let properties within the Nottingham and Loughborough areas. Um, now, I typically, uh, you, you'll find property investors will start with single let properties uh, just to get their confidence up, to get an understanding what buy to lets is all about. And I think that is a good place for anyone to start, quite honestly. The one thing I would say or caveat that advice or tips with is to get educated. I've ran um, property investment uh, seminars with the likes of Simon Zucci, Liam Ryan, Paul Preston, Trevor Cutmore. There are many, many um, gurus, Arshalahi, uh, all many great guys out there that will do property investing um, advice. Lafina Diamandis actually does one for property investing for doctors. So there are a lot of experts out there and I really just kind of go along nowadays to uh, support them uh, from a tax advisory capacity. Um, and I've done my own property networking events um, and I've also written in YPN, uh, which I still do, funny enough, um, and also the NLA magazines as well. I've appeared in their trade uh, publications as well, so I've been around a bit in terms of uh, my tax advice. Um, investing in property since 2006, um, you know, it, things have moved on since 2006. You know, there's been the emergence of HMOs, you know, back in maybe 2010, 2012, really started kicking on. Uh, and now we're seeing service accommodation uh, kicking in from maybe two, three years ago. Um, the big thing for me is that uh, we've changed from single let properties to single let micro pods or flats, if you like, um, which is taking a, a big old unit and then converting those into single let properties, which we then rent out. Um, that's been a great thing for us because we've been able to invest our money and get a good return on investment, as you can see, between 15 and 25%. Um, and it's, uh, it allows us to act like a HMO, but uh, it's, it's clearly uh, still divided. So you have your own private quarters. Um, it's not shared kitchen, it's not shared living room. It's all separate, like a, a one bedroom flat ease, but it's micro and it uses the same boiler. It uses the same water system. It uses the same electricity. So therefore we don't have this issue of having five different service charges, which is great for a profitability side of things. And I kind of like it because HMIs are quite noisy. I've got my own business. I don't really want noisy tenants going on here. So this is a great way of um, getting the most out of our investments. Um, so that's kind of where we come, uh, I've come from, my background. Um, why work with us at Optimize? That's always a good question to have. Um, and there's probably many good reasons to be fair, but I'm gonna take you through the journey of um, of tax and, and really where we fit into. And the first one is being stamp duty land tax, you know, from the immediate point of being a property investor, you have different types of tax. So stamp duty land tax, when you're buying a property, uh, can be quite cumbersome. You have VAT when you're refurbishing a property and VAT can also be applied to when you're buying properties as well. Once you've got your property up and running and collecting rent, then you have income tax as well. And income tax, because of Section 24, uh, means that people will be paying more tax than ever before. You've also got capital gains tax. So if you do dispose of a property, then you've got capital gains tax considerations. And then finally, uh, HMRC aren't done with you just because you die. Um, they do want their fill as well from an IHT perspective, which is 40% over a certain threshold. But let's go back and understand what, what the issues may be. The first one being the error by solicitor. The first bit is stamp duty land tax. We've had solicitors that made uh, horrendous mistakes on the conveyance of a particular property, or properties, I should say. And it's resulted in one client uh, actually paying £35,000 worth more SDLT than they should have done. And we wouldn't have picked it up unless um, we speak to our clients before they make a property purchase. And we do always say to our clients, look, before you buy a property, before you refurbish a property, before you sell a property, you kind of get the gist. 
we ask our clients to give us a call to make sure that they're not kind of going to be paying too much tax because you don't know what you don't know. And that's where our expertise will come in. And it's nice to also have a conversation and like we're doing right now, whereby you post questions, I give the answers, and you go away happy. So this error, £35,000, we was able to reclaim from HMRC, and uh, the red faces of the solicitors had to go through that process, and um, I'm not sure what they ended up doing with their solicitors bill, but I know what I'd be asking them to do. Uh, VAT, let's go on to that. So VAT is typically 20% on any materials that you buy. Uh, depending on the tradesperson, they may or may not be VAT registered. And if they're not VAT registered, clearly, you have no VAT to consider. However, if they are VAT registered, then they will charge 20% on all the works that they do. Now, there are certain caveats to the, the world of VAT and the rates that's applied. You can have a reduction from 20% to 5% on certain properties, or you can even have a zero rate uh, VAT structure. Now, that uh, in itself can be an unknown. It can be the uncertainties. You mean, again, you don't know what you don't know. As a result of that, it's always good to hear from our clients to understand what the type of property it is that they're refurbishing and what the end result's going to be. That way we can say, well, we feel that the VAT we could be reduced or can be mitigated altogether. Now, one particular client, uh, Gary, Gary uh, Sini, great guy in Birmingham who I uh, met up with, we talked a bit about a particular uh, a conversion of, of a property and his builder is going to charge him ten thousand pounds more VAT than they ought to. Now that's not the builder's fault to be honest because their accountant had advised them incorrectly. Um, and again you don't know what you don't know so I'm not having a go at the accountant at that point in time. Um, I was simply educating them in terms of the VAT ruling. Should have charged you an education slot but uh, at the end of the day those accountants have got to work together. So we had his VAT and uh, the accountant of the builder uh, was happy that so there was a reduction of VAT and therefore the they client of ours uh, had a reduced bill of £10,000 just because of VAT. Income tax, that's an interesting one. So we have lots and lots of clients that pay too much tax and majority of people that are in property investing, especially when there are couples involved, are likely to be paying more income tax than they need to be. And that's because they've got properties in their own name. Uh, that's because they've got bank interest. That's because they've got limited companies and they're taking wages and dividends out of. And we believe that uh, there, there are, well, not believe, we know that uh, with our support that clients will be able to remove uh, certain income tax uh, liabilities. We also must take into account Section 24 and not just the tax that's being paid last year or indeed this year, but what is the tax that you're likely to pay because of Section 24 going forwards? That's a big question. And the one thing that we're trying to do with our clients is to educate them to understand how Section 24 is going to impact them and what are the mitigation factors. Capital gains tax, again, um, I think the thing, common theme here actually between CDT and IHT is I believe that these taxes are totally optional. You do not need to pay CDT or IHT. That doesn't mean you flee the country. That's not my advice here. Uh, and then never to pay HMRC. Um, you're not a famous actor that's about to go into prison or a footballer for that matter. Um, I think the, the purpose of CGT and IHT, if you use the law correctly, then they can be mitigated. And that is the purpose of using our expertise advice. And we've saved a lot of our clients, funny enough, CGT by using various deed tr trust documents, um, which then allows them to use CGT annual allowances and therefore reduce the CGT, as you can see on the screen. So there's many, many ways of reducing tax, but it's again, uh, the thing I would say is you don't know what you don't know. And uh, that's very true in all forms of tax. Now, the way that we work is that uh, our services do start from 69.95, and people think, well, that's got quite a lot of price per month for your services. Well, maybe, but what is the cost of getting it wrong? As you've seen above, there are countless thousands of pounds that can go down and uh, well, go into HMRC's coffers rather than yours. You know, and our fees of 69.95 equate to £2.31 per month uh, per day, which is equivalent to cost of coffee, which I'm really terrible at and I get myself every day. Uh, now, I don't scoff at that, 
but there are people out there that will scoff at the price of 69.95 and rather make the mistakes of paying too much tax and that's quite okay with us we want to work with people that are looking to be proactive and work with proactive tax accountants like us to make sure that uh, they invest increase their wealth and reduce their tax bill now why work with us there are plenty plenty of uh, changes that we're all seeing. There's been the removal of the 10% wear and tear, and this is all since the 2006 budget, uh, sorry, 2016 budget. Uh, there's now the SDLT 3% surcharge, there's section 24. There's gonna be changes to the way that capital gains tax is gonna be calculated and when it's going to be paid. Uh, there's entrepreneurs relief changes and GAR and using limited companies. I'm gonna take a snippet, uh, top line of each one of those as much as I can. But of course, we only have an hour. So it's not as though we have three hour seminar going on here. This is just really giving you good top line numbers. But I think the key thing for me is that we're always looking for the solutions and not crying over the problems. And that's what we've always got to do as accountants. Now, you may want to discuss our services. You may be already discussing with us about us becoming your accountants and your, your tax specialists. Um, what I would always say is you can do so by going to our website www.optimizeaccountants.co.uk and you can discuss our services there you can also get a 30 minute tax consultation where you can upload your questions and your forms and the uh, all those questions will be addressed in the morning by our tax advisors and lead accountants and um, on the call it's there just to talk about the solution rather than the problem so we're trying to get you the solution now we could say well I'll have a conversation two three hours actually it's a bit like going to the dentist uh, I don't really want to be in pain for 45 minutes in the dentist chair uh, I'd rather it be done in five minutes and I'll pay the whatever the rate is um, so if you're th thinking about solution, that's what it's about. It's very efficient in terms of how we approach it. Um, so look at the problem that you've at, got at hand and uh, identify if that 225 is really worth your, your tax savings. Uh, you can use the code WEB25 to get that discount, by the way. So feel free to go and do that. Throughout this session, I will be answering your Q&A, so uh, make sure that you go into the chat box and you'll be typing your questions in. And I will be going across to the uh, platform as well, just to see if there's anything uh, on there. There's no questions on either one, so I shall move on to get the basics in place. Uh, the first thing I would say is speak to three people whenever you're talking about property investing or indeed disposal. The first person you might want to speak to is your solicitor, not necessarily your tax advisor. The second person you might want to speak to is your mortgage broker because you need to get finance in place. And then third and lastly, you might want to be talking to your tax advisor. And the reason why I say you should be speaking to all three is because you want a balanced view you want to make sure that there's no conflict between one person giving you advice from one discipline to another. And it allows you to take all this information in and then make an informed decision. Ultimately, the decisions you, you take is uh, what governs your success or failure in life. And I think having a sensible conversation with all three parties is, in my view, essential. Um, I, I know people try and look at Facebook and try and get advice. I've got to be honest, guys, if you're getting free advice, it's worth exactly that free and it's cheap and it's probably not going to help you. You should be taking professional advice wherever you can to make sure that uh, you've got all your bases covered. Um, I would make sure that you get a separate bank account for your property business. And the reason for that is if your property bank account is going up all the time, you should know that your property business is doing really well. Thank you very much. If the property bank account is going down every single month and you're putting money into it, then you know there's a problem. At some point, you're going to have to address the fact that your properties are making a loss. And uh, that may mean some tough decisions to be made. Um, I would also keep your receipts for six years. HMRC can investigate you and they can go back for six years uh, to, to understand your tax position and uh, indeed what tax liabilities you may have, depending on what they uncover. If you have no receipts, they can ask for that tax to be reclaimed and then you may have penalties and interest. So make sure you keep your, your receipts at hand. You'll notice in brackets I put in there uh, to keep your receipts both physical and electronic. And the reason for that is because you um, want to make sure that you've got a, a cover. 
if your receipts are physical and they're in your office or in your bedroom and something happens, you get burgled or that place catches fire, then you lost uh, all of those receipts. Well, if HMRC investigate, they're not going to be too concerned that you had a, a you know, burning of the house. Uh, they're going to want to know, well, where's this expenditure receipt? And if you can't prove it, then we may ask for the tax. Um, so I'd always keep electronic copy as well. Now, conversely, I wouldn't keep just a, a electronic copy on things like Zero QuickBooks Sage if you can upload your receipts. The reason for that is if you change subscriptions to another software package, then you have lost your old transactions that have been loaded into the system. Uh, and therefore, using something, something like Dropbox may be a good solution for you guys. Get the basics in place. So one thing I would always say is make sure that you use an accounting system that uh, tells you what your actual costs are, your income from your properties are. And the reason for that is because you want to make sure that you are making as much profit as possible. So using an accounting system like Zero QuickBooks, Sage, etc., uh, will help you to manage your business. Now, a lot of people I know full well um, don't put, use these systems or they think these systems are for their accountants. And guys, you've got to really think about how you want to be seen. Are you serious about your property investments? Because if you are, you wouldn't just throw £20,000 into a bin liner and just hope it works out. You're going to be all looking at the stats of the share prices going up or down, or if you've got uh, Forex, then you're going to be watching that going up and down using graphs and so on. And yet it seems very strange that when people buy their property investments, they don't tend to do the kind of income and expenditure on the bookkeeping to see if they're making money or not. They'd rather attend networking events, courses, talk to their JV partners in coffee shops, and uh, you know, let's hope that things work out. And actually, that doesn't apply, does it? Unless you're keeping your eye on the ball, using these kind of systems to see, well, what's my income, what's my cost, what's my profit? Um, unfortunately, I think most people that don't do this will fail compared to the ones that do. Let's talk about section 24. I'm going to just take a quick drink, actually, because uh, if you've got any questions, feel free to type those in. And uh, if you haven't, then I'll go straight on. So let me just uh, swig the water. Anyone on my Facebook Live? Nope. So I can move on. Uh, so let's talk about section 24 then, everyone. Um, strap in, because this is about mortgage interest relief. Um, what we're going to do is uh, give you an example as I explain how Section 24 mortgage interest relief really will work. Um, before 1617, you were allowed to offset all of the mortgage interest costs, but being phased in 25% per, per year, uh, after 2021, mortgage interest re relief will be phased out altogether. You will have what they call a 20% tax reducer, um, but rather than going to the semantics of law, uh, let's look at an, an example here. And what I thought I would do, I would introduce you to Jane. Jane's a medic, uh, locum doctor, high rate taxpayer, and she's got this particular property as well. And Jane wants to know, well, how will Section 24 affect me as a high rate taxpayer? Well, Jane, I can simply give you an, a simple answer on this, is if you have a property, the income clearly doesn't change from one year to another unless you put uh, rent increases on board and you've got voids. But let's imagine that the income doesn't really change. And uh, what will happen is that you'll notice that income stays staying at 12,000. Mortgage interest is allowed in the 1617 tax computations, but it's removed from 2021. And that is the fundamental change. And if we swamp right down to the bottom there, you'll notice that poor old Jane's got a property of 1,500. That's yielding a loss, by the way. Um, why would she have a property that's yielding loss? Because some investors out there will be uh, banking on the fact that they've got a property in London and there's capital growth. You'd have to say nowadays is there capital growth in London? We don't know this because of, sec uh, with, because of Brexit um, and Section 24 as well with the impact of this might have with investors in, uh, in, in London. Uh, but ultimately, she has this property, she's banked on capital growth, so therefore she doesn't mind making a bit of a loss on that because she thinks over a period of time I will be winning. Um, however, when it comes to the new world of 2021 tax computations, uh, she's got a paper profit of £6,500. That's not a real profit, clearly. That is a uh, paper profit of £6,500. 
And uh, as you can see right there, that uh, she is not going to be doing that well from a tax position. And this is how it kind of works out. 1617, there's clearly no tax to pay. In fact, that loss of 1,500 can be carried forwards. Unfortunately, 2021 rolls by and she's now got a paper profit of 6,500. She's a high rate taxpayer, as we mentioned earlier, and now she's got a tax liability of 2,600 pounds, which may be a shock to her um, as the years progress and she's paying more tax year on year. She does get this 20% interest relief, which is basically 20% of the mortgage interest cost, which gives the tax reducer of 1,600, but still means poor old Jane has 1,000 pounds tax liability. We have to add on to the fact that she's got a cash outflow already of £1,500. That means that poor old Jane, as a high rate taxpayer, has now got a cash outflow of £2,500 on this particular property. Now, she's got multiple properties. She's going to have a compounding issue. Talking of compound issue, Section 24 is being phased in. So we know that it's going to be progressively worse. But let's have a look at the uh, base rate of interest. You can see that the interest rate is really low at the minute. And yes, it's crept up a little, but not significantly. And the, my firm belief is that mortgage interest rates will increase. And as a result of that, if it's going year on year increase alongside Section 24, then there's going to be a compound issue because there's going to be more cash outflow um, from you paying more interest to the banks, but there is going to be less interest relief from a tax perspective and therefore you'll be paying more tax. So you've got this compound issue and unless you're doing this kind of forecast for yourself, then uh, you, you won't know where you are. And this is where this comes into it, whereby um, we, what we do with our clients is say, okay, based on a particular set of data that we have from your tax return, which we can only assume is correct, we may be having some variations. But what we always say to our clients, like this is the amount of property profits that you've got, this is the tax that you're likely to see, and this is the percentage. Now, people do respond really well to percentages, and that's why we do it. In this regard, you can see in 1617, one particular client of ours uh, is an additional rate tax bet, so earning more than £150,000, and their tax bill on their property is 45%. Now, you kind of think, well, why did you buy properties in your own name in the first place? Because you're paying 45% instead of 19% from a company perspective. By the by, they've got a 45% tax bill. In the future, that tax is likely to increase to 88% because of Section 24 mortgage interest relief cap changes. Now, what does this person do? There's plenty. What we always say to our clients is once you get this forecast through, give us a call so we can talk through these numbers and we can tweak them. If we can tweak the property profits because there's been some more refurbishment works done or the, we've changed the configuration of our properties, we've, got, uh, we've paid down some mortgages, then we can re-establish what those property profits are and the mortgage interest that's paid to re-establish what we think the property tax is going to be and has that really helped. And uh, therefore, we can work with our clients to go through different scenarios to say, well, if I paid down my mortgages, et cetera. And the kind of things that we talk about uh, with our clients, and I'm going to just move myself slightly so you can see that wording. Um, the kind of things that we talk to our clients about is, can you convert some of your properties from being a typical um, residential single let property or HMO into a commercial property? into service accommodation, into holiday lets, because Section 24 does not affect those type of properties. So it could be a good way to change strategy, make more money whilst reducing your tax liability. Rent to rent, um, again, if you're renting properties from other landlords, you do not have mortgage interest rate, um, sorry, you don't have mortgage interest costs. As a result of that, there will be no uh, tax for you to pay. Um, or additional tax to pay. But what you do need to think about, well, what about the landlord? You are obviously renting from a landlord where the Section 24 uh, could uh, apply to them. Now, many people out there will say that Section 24 is going to affect the majority of landlords. I don't think it is because not every landlord has mortgages, believe it or believe it not. 
Um, having no mortgage, which is the third point, actually paying down your mortgages may be a better return on your investment now because of the amount of tax that you could reduce. Remember from the previous slide that this person had an 88% tax bill. Well, if you had no mortgage, the tax would be held at 45%. So you've got to weigh out, well, what is my tax saving compared to the amount of money I've got to pay off my mortgages? And does one outweigh the other? Clearly, they will. Losses on your property portfolio. If you have a loss on your property portfolio, then Section 24 may not affect you straight away. But again, similar to my compound issue, if your losses are whittled down very quickly, which there will be now because of these changes, and you've got greater interest rates, then there could be a, a triple whammy in terms of the uh, impact of your profitability. So it's very important that you do these forecasts for the next four or five years and just to see how much tax you're likely to pay. And of course, we talk about limited companies. It's a big old subject. It's not something we're going to go into uh, great detail about. But obviously, if you're investing in properties, then the tax rate in a limited company is uh, just 19%. And the mortgage interest costs are allowed 100% to be offset against the property income. And there are different ways of uh, minimizing the amount of tax that you have to pay whilst the property is in that company. And I'm gonna go through a bit of an example actually on that. So if there's any questions that you guys have got, then please feel free to type those in um, as we go into, I believe, the next subject. So if you guys got any questions, feel free to type those in now um, and I will get to, you're all pretty quiet by the way, so hopefully you're not watching some Jeremy Karsha uh, watching me uh, on this webinar. Um, so I'll take a drink and uh, let's move on. Okay, uh, that's the nice thing about live webinars is they can't really pause me having a drink, but uh, here we are. Um, let's talk about limited companies and why people are moving over to them and what are the tax uh, benefits of doing so. Uh, I think the first thing is to, to consider is if you have no other form of income, and let's imagine that you're a, a property investor and you have no uh, properties in your own name, they're all in a limited company. There are ways of extracting uh, cash out of that company uh, via form of wages. And this is again provided you don't have a job elsewhere. So you can take out 8,424 uh, tax free wages from the company. There's no tax, no national insurance. And many people listening to this will quite rightly be saying, well, the tax, the personal allowance is a lot more than that. So why am I not factoring that in? Well, the purpose of me saying only 8424 is because of national insurance. Once you go to above that number, then your employer will pay 13.8% and as an employee up to a certain amount will pay 12% national insurance. So combined, you're looking at 25% um, national insurance. So therefore, I would always say go up to 8424 because you're avoiding that unnecessary NI cost. As a shareholder of a limited company, you can take out £2,000 worth of tax-free dividends and you do not pay tax, obviously, on that. And that applies to each shareholder. Now, if you have four companies, it means that you can only take out £2,000 out of your entire portfolio of limited companies. Okay, It doesn't mean you get £2,000 uh, tax-free dividends from each company, which I have seen happen and clients, unfortunately, have got that in their minds as well. Uh, it applies to you, that £2,000, not the, what you've got in, in terms of companies. 100% mortgage interest costs, as I mentioned before, will be allowed in your limited company. And you can use uh, share structures to reduce IHT for wealth planning as well. But we do need to remember that mortgage interest costs will be higher in a limited company. And we are seeing rates of between 1% and 2% more in a limited company than if the person bought a property in their own name and got a standard buy to let mortgage. So we do need to kind of balance out the mortgage interest costs being increased in the limited company structure versus the tax savings that you're likely to make. And that's something that you need to work with your advisors on. Uh, some of the benefits that you can have is that your limited company can contribute towards your pension as well. Um, I do feel that there's not enough investment in pensions right now. Uh, guilty, your my lord. Um, I don't invest it towards a pension. I probably should do. I've got investments and I've also got um, 
this limited company as a county business, but I don't have a pension and I really ought to, to be fair. Um, but the contributions made by your company will be tax deductible, so why not get the tax relief on it? Um, your company can pay for medical uh, treatment, so if you need to wear glasses, you need some tests, um, there are certain other circumstances where your company can pay for your medical bills as well. Um, so if you have a well person check, then your limited company can do that, pay for that as well if you go privately. Um, star celebration, yay! Let's talk about star celebration, shall we? It's good to look at your success and uh, take stock. Uh, is something that I've been told myself, and um, to say, you know, you're doing really well. You've done this. You've done this. You've achieved this. Uh, why don't you take uh, the staff members out, and uh, you can do so, provided that uh, the amount that you pay per annum is not more than 150, 150 pounds per employee. Now, as soon as you go over and above that, the full amount is then becomes taxable. So make sure you, you go out, celebrate, yes, but be mindful that you don't spend more than £150 per person, per annum in your company, uh, because they, they will then become a tax liability. You can also give, uh, not obviously, you can, as a company, give vouchers, so high street vouchers, which are non-cash redeemable, to the directors of the limited company. What I tend to do is buy vouchers and then give those to the employees. And you can do that for 300 pounds up for, it, for the directors. If you have employees, there is no limit, but for directors, there is a limit of 300 pounds gift vouchers. And the last one is perk box, which is hand in hand with the high street vouchers as well. So if you get the John Lewis 300 pounds vouchers over a course of a year, um, if you use perk box, Excuse me. If you use perk box, you can uh, get further discounts from that so as well. So you might buy, you might get three hundred pounds worth of vouchers, let's say, from your company as a director over the course of a year. But that could buy you something like three hundred and twenty, three hundred forty pounds worth of vouchers simply because you're using perk box to get the discounts. So a great combination between the two. So that's all I'm going to talk about limited companies. I know there was a, I had a few emails about incorporation. Unfortunately, incorporation alone can be about an hour. We do those kind of webinars for our clients, but that is just for clients. We, we kind of need to be careful of what advice we give away um, and support, but also things like incorporation is quite tricky, and therefore we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Doing this kind of session, funny enough, with our clients via web, a video conference, and talking to them about incorporation, whether it's useful or not. So I'm not gonna to go into too much detail. Apologies if you think uh, this, this webinar is gonna cover every single subject. It just simply can't. I'm not here for 12 hours, and you'll be pretty bored of listening to me and looking at me, if I'm quite honest. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to go to those kind of questions. Uh, but let's just have a look, see if there's anything in there. Uh, Mike was saying, oh, there, I've got a question from Facebook, would you believe? So uh, let me just have a like on that. Uh, so the question I had is, how would you structure a company that does rent-to-rent -rent deal packaging, flips and buy to let refurbishment finance? It's a great question, Michael. I think it really does depend on your tax position. You know, if you're earning, if you've got more kind of taxable income of circa 40, 50,000 pounds, and you're looking, uh, well, yeah, between once you get to taxable income of 40 fifty thousand pounds you need to think about whether you should use a limited company structure or not um, it's not always necessary if you think about extracting all of that money from the company then it becomes tax inefficient actually to have that kind of structure in place of a company and then moving money back into yourself it's only ideal if you've got say hundred thousand pounds profits going on in your limited company and you are quite happy for your lifestyle purposes to just extract 50,000 pounds out of it, leaving 50,000 in the company to reinvest. That then becomes a serious consideration to using a limited company structure. But actually, if you've got 50,000 pounds and you're gonna spend every single penny, then maybe a limited company isn't really useful for you from a tax perspective. Uh, you mentioned, Michael, actually, that you've got flips. So a great question on that is, well, if you've got flips going on, then there is a degree of risk. And if you've got a degree of risk going on there, then what you need to also consider is, well, what happens if I've got a property development, a slate comes off and the roof hits someone on the head and kills them? Uh, there is a big uh, insurance claim. You, this could be litigation involved as well. If you have those type of developments in a limited company, the risk is held there. Um, and then it won't affect your personal uh, assets or 
artifacts. So from a risk profile, it may be useful to have risky types of investments in a company structure rather than in your own name. It may not be, uh, may not serve you for you from a tax perspective, but from a risk, it may be. But great question, Mike. Hopefully that's useful for you. And if you could just pin a, a, a comment, just say if it's useful or not, that'd be fantastic. Just give me some feedback. Let's talk about tax structures now. And we talked about uh, structures, so Michael's led me on very beautifully onto this particular subject. And I'd like to talk to you about two clients that we've got. We've changed the names clearly because we don't want to uh, share information about our clients. Uh, but they had an investment company and uh, they, they set it up with one share a class each and um, unfortunately they was taking dividends out of that uh, uh, let's say for 10 twenty thousand pounds um, each person and then before they know it uh, they, they're doing their tax return and clients being taxed at 32.5 percent because he's a high rate taxpayer and Claire's being taxed at 7.5 percent tax because she's a basic rate taxpayer now if they had planned it out accordingly, they would have done something different. Uh, the share structures would have been different and the amount of dividends that would be paid to each member would also be different. Uh, as a result of the simple changes that you can make by speaking to uh, tax accountants is the simple structural changes that you require to pay less tax. Unfortunately, there are again people that will say to you on Facebook, LinkedIn, that you can do your, your, your DLY setting up a company and you're like, you don't need to pay a solicitor, you don't need to pay an accountant. No, you're right, absolutely right. You can pay £12.50, do it yourself and get it horrendously wrong. Um, so it's really important that you, there's a great old adage here that uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And uh, people try and do things on the cheap will get a bad result. I promise you that for certain. And Clive and Claire, unfortunately, uh, were in this particular position. And their accountant, funny enough, didn't help them through uh, the first two years that this kind of thing happened. It, was, it wasn't until they came to us that we said, why have you got this structure in place? And they were quite surprised, um, but uh, quite happy that we made the changes for them. Now, you may have, um, and funny enough, Michael was just talking about this. So, Michael, there it is just for you. If you've got um, two company structures, one is for your investment buy to hold, and then you've got another company which is there for your trade, your flips, and your services. Now, the reason why we talk about having two companies is because we do not want to mix the uh, risky projects which are held in the trade SPV or special, uh, special purpose vehicle I never got that wrong not sure why um, so you may have a flip within the trade company on the right hand side and you've got your investment company which is on the left hand side and you certainly don't want to mix the two because the risk as I mentioned earlier you don't want the assets on your buy to holds being kind of taken away from you because the flip didn't work out and actually it's uh, it's, it's uh, something devastating has happened um, you do need to be mindful if you've got two companies that means you need to, to consider uh, how you take the distribution of dividends and uh, that can be quite tricky in itself especially when you've got different year ends and tax planning of well how much dividends should I take you know well it depends how much tax do you want to pay um, so really that the, the whenever we speak to a, a client we're always saying well how do you want to extract money out of your company using wages what kind of share structure do you need to use using ABC let's restructure your company and then make sure we consider things like entrepreneurs relief or long-term tax planning as well we've also got to remember that one company can loan to another company so your trade company that has lots and lots of money could indeed loan money to the investment company uh, to buy its buy to let hold properties um, the thing you need to think about is if you've got one company which is trade and you're hoping for entrepreneurs relief if you start loaning money to another company then also that becomes an investment and it could scupper entrepreneurs relief so you can tell why I always ask our clients to book calls with us before they do something that could be detrimental to their tax planning Okay, so let's go through an example. You could be working with joint venture partners. I'm just gonna go see Michael then. Uh, Michael, brilliant. I'm glad that it's been useful, Michael. Brilliant, I'm pleased about that. Um, 
So you could have JVs in place, so whereby you talk about uh, working with joint venture partners, and on the right hand side, you'll notice that I've got three particular JV partners. Each of them are generating one hundred thousand pounds after tax profits. That means there's three hundred pounds, a three hundred thousand pounds worth of profit to be made there. Now that's great, but what we need to think about: well, you've got three hundred thousand. Uh, your share of that will have to be taken by you as dividends in this structure. Now, you may not want to take all of that into account. So if you've got £150,000 um, profits that you didn't actually need to take, you're still going to be taxed on it because of the structure of uh, the way that the companies are all being set up. Each one of these SPVs are all in your name. And as a result of that, unfortunately, all of that money is going to be taxed in your names. That could mean that you'd be paying 38.1% tax on those dividends even though you didn't need the money and you're quite happy to leave it in an investment structure. So again, one thing I would always say to our clients is, well, let's talk about your lifestyle. Where, you know, what is your income flow going to be? Are you going to be in employment for a long period of time? If you are, then the limited company could be worth it. Or you think about giving you your job maybe in two, three years time. Well, okay, you may be paying more tax because of section 24 in the short term, but actually, if you're going to give up your job anyway and become a basic rate taxpayer, live off the property income, then in four or five years' time, you will be a basic rate taxpayer again. So why use a limited company structure at all? And so we do have these serious conversations with our clients. And it's also about lifestyle as well. If you need all the money out of your limited company to fund your lifestyle, then ultimately, I would say it's not worth using a limited company. You could be paying more tax uh, by extracting every single penny out of the company than if you just had it in your own name. So it's, it's something that you need to think about. It's not something where you go on Facebook, do I need a limited company? And someone says, yes. And you go, right, okay, ABC Limited, done. Uh, £12.50, thank you very much, because then you go, well, hold on a minute. Uh, have I done the right thing? And um, you need to be confident, really, in terms of the approach that you take. And taking special advice is always something I would suggest you do. So let's talk about the kind of safe scenario whereby you've got three limited companies, we made 300,000 pounds, but what we've done, we've, moved, we've created this holding company that owns the individual SPVs. So the holding company is now owned by Clive and, um, I forgot her name, Clive and Claire. Um, and they, they basically hold this, uh, they've got this holding company that owns these three subsidiaries. Now, they've got 50% share, so 150,000 pounds now goes into the limited company, the holding company. You'll notice that there's no tax here, no tax at all. There's no tax of distribution of dividends from one company to another. And as a result of that, the tax planning is beautiful because what this means is that they could say, well, let's take 50,000 pounds out for our holding company to Clive and Claire. But you'll notice on the left hand side now we've got two thousand pounds worth of dividends which can be tax free and what we might do is say well we out of that we've got to think about well what would the tax position be if they've got dividends elsewhere um if we distribute that fifty thousand pounds what would it look like well you can see there we could say that's the uh forty thousand if they've got tax free dividends elsewhere that uh forty thousand would be paid to claire she's a basic rate taxpayer so therefore the tax would be 7.5 percent and we'll just pay £10,000 to Clive because he's a, he might be a, a basic rate taxpayer and creeping into being a high rate taxpayer because of the dividends he takes in the previous example. But if he's got a tax free, uh, if he's got a basic rate tax ban to use, then we should use it uh, to, to minimize his tax liability, but allow him to take dividends out of the company. So there are many, many variables at play here. And again, one thing that we do with our clients at the end of the tax year. For their company is, is look at what their personal income is being on their self-assessment as well as the amount of surplus profits that can be taken as dividends and we have a conversation to say well this is the things that we would recommend you do um, what, what what do you think um, again many accountants don't even give that advice uh, which is shocking really uh, for the uh, client because they may do something that will cost them an awful lot more tax as we've discovered earlier uh, by looking at Clive and Claire. 
Okay, I'm just going to go over to any questions that you might have now. So uh, no questions from the Facebook group. No guy. Oh, I do have questions. Apologies, I've missed a question here. And uh, the question was: Can you get mortgage uh, relief on mortgage on money loan to a property company to buy buy to let? Um, now. If you got mortgage, I guess you talk about your own buy to let mortgage. Bear in mind, section 24 is about mortgage interest in your own name. If you have refinanced uh, one of your mortgages, uh, sorry, what refinanced one of your properties um, to put money into a company, it still will be a finance cost. And as a result of that, um, unfortunately, it will be, form part of your computation and then will be subject to section 24. You can do what something called, uh, I think, I believe is HS340, which allows you to move the interest from you personally, but even though you've raised the money, and move the interest uh, into the limited company. So even though you've got the mortgage uh, in your own name and you may refinance that, that chunk of loan can be, in effect, be paid uh, by the limited company in terms of the interest. So it depends which way you want to do it. I would say take advice on that because there should be ways of minimizing Section 24 if, uh, if indeed you are loaning money to a limited company. So I hope I've answered it, but I think you do kind of need to take advice in terms of how that instrument works for you. And indeed, if it does work for you, it may not. Um, okay, great question though. I, uh, I've not had that one before. So let's just go to um, back to uh, the property journey. So as I said, um, you know, we do need to think about the, the, the tax throughout our journey. We've only really covered off, uh, we haven't even covered off SDLT at all, even though there, is a, there are pit holes and that and disasters waiting for you. There's VAT issues, we're not even talked about that. All we really focus on is elements of income tax, haven't we? Because we talked about, uh, tax in, a, in your own personal name because of section 24 and we also talked about corporation tax which isn't really part of this genre because it's all about you personally uh, we haven't talked about cgc and ihd so we've only covered one subject and that's one thing i would say to you is that uh, already we've covered off quite a lot of subjects uh, and things that you'll need to now go away and think about um, but we've only covered one tax which is amazing really of how complicated things are and make sure you go onto our YouTube channel. Um, I'm going to be putting this video now. Uh, I've got my slides done. Um, so if you want to learn more, please do go onto our, our YouTube channel, Optimize Accountants. Press subscribe and then press the notification bar as well, the, the bell there. And that tells you when a new video has been launched. So make sure you're on that. Um, I'm also going to do a bit more work on our social media in terms of the, the articles that we have written. So we'll be putting that on our Facebook uh, page as well. So when I write a, an article, I will be publishing it on there as well. And um, if you're an audible listener and you're quite happy to listen to me uh, in your car or dare I say in your bed when you're trying to sleep, I have to think about how I phrase that for next webinar. Um, but if you wish to uh, listen to the audible version of these kind of uh, podcasts, then you can do so by going to iTunes and getting that. There is also Google Play as well. So uh, don't feel I'm just going towards an Apple uh, version of this. But you can go on and uh, whichever medium works for you. If you prefer to read, go to our Facebook page. If you want to watch a video, YouTube channel, listen to us, iTunes or even Google Play. Uh, that pretty much brings me to an end. Of course, you can discuss our services going to optimizeaccountants.co.uk. You can use the code WEB25 to get 25% discount from the 30-minute call, which is usually £300. You can get that for 225 Again, don't think about the price. Think of the cost of getting it wrong, and that should uh, hopefully lead you to being confident and comfortable with your tax planning for the future.